a sermon for the sixth Sunday after Trinity. Help! We all need it. We all need support, someone to hold on to when our confidence fails, when we feel ourselves slipping. We need to be sure, sure that we are doing the right thing, sure that God is on our side, sure that our sins really are forgiven and they won't come back to haunt us, sure that we will be with God when we die. We know God loves us, he loves everyone, even those who reject him, but does he like us? Does he approve of us? Do we please him? As we were reminded last week, the book of Job looks at some of life's most difficult questions. It's written almost like a courtroom drama. The storyline is literally squeezed into the first two chapters and the last chapter. And in between we have what amounts to a series of speeches, first from one side, then from the other. For most of the book, Job sits in his defender's chair listening to his friend's explanation about what he should or shouldn't do to settle his problems. But there are some key moments when important truths are revealed, when Jesus' light shines through. And the passage we heard this evening is one of them. So the court is in session. God has taken his seat. The prosecutor, Satan, has inflicted his worst. The three witnesses for the defence, his friends, have change sides and are openly, atta openly attacking Job. You must have done something wrong, just look at you. Bildad has just had his second turn and Job stands up to reply. If I've sinned, he said, then surely it's between me and God. Why are you adding to my torture? Job feels trapped by them and by God. It's like he's been entangled in a net, set upon, stripped, broken, uprooted, counted as an enemy under siege, nothing more than a tent to protect him. Even so, Job's faith is still strong, but this adds to his suffering because he sees God's hand in it all. He doesn't know why. In this lonely state, he asks for pity. If he can't get a not guilty verdict, at least write his case down so others might appreciate his plight in the future. And then, as he touches rock bottom, his faith leads him on a new hope, and he reaches a turning point. In a moment of revelation, Job suddenly cries out, But I know my vindicator lives, and he will rise last to speak in court. As Martin Luther King put it, he's climbed to the top of the mountain and seen the other side. Job realises he has a vindicator or redeemer, to champion his cause. He knows now that he cannot stand before God in his own righteousness. Blameless behaviour is not enough. A redeemer witness is needed to argue his case, and that witness is none other than God himself. I shall discern my witness standing at my side, see my defending counsel, even God himself, whom I shall see with my own eyes, I myself no other. Job is certain of his innocence, he is also certain that death is not the end. He will personally see his Redeemer and his God. The NIV translation for verse 26 uses the words, After my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. From here on this revelation will be his reference point, and he will keep coming back to it when the pressure becomes unbearable. What Job realised was that the most important question was not, is the universe friendly, but is there a friend in the universe? But Job could never imagine that God would provide this kinsman from within his own trinity, his only son, Jesus Christ, who will be the means of reconciling generations to come to God. And this leads us on to our second lesson, where the court is in session again, but this time it's the role of Jesus that's under discussion. He is our high priest who has taken his seat at the throne of the majesty in heaven. A minister in the real sanctuary, a tent set up by the Lord, not by man. The author of Hebrews uses the familiar images from Jewish, Jewish theology to explain that Jesus' role in our redemption is not man-made. 
The courtroom he mediates in is not an earthly one, but a heavenly one. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all. The ministry Jesus has been given is superior to ours. He is the mediator of a better covenant, established on better promises. The ways of the old covenant were not designed to last. Animal sin sacrifices and rituals were not the way to change self-lovers into God-lovers. Jesus Christ has replaced all the procedures and paraphernalia of the old with his own body. If we are prepared to accept, respond to the sacrifices made for us, we will be reconciled to God. Jesus died on the cross so our sins can be forgiven, so we can be brought back to God. Jesus gave his own life and his body in one decisive act, which was accepted by God as eternal, sufficient, eternally sufficient for us all and for our sins. Guilt causes half the troubles in the world. Denying it or blaming others doesn't work, but Jesus' blood does. Through Jesus, God forgives and forgets. Through Jesus, there's a better way. Through Jesus, God reaches into our hearts and we will be accepted by him. Through Jesus, we will come to know God personally, receive forgiveness. Becoming a believer in Jesus Christ means the rules are taken off the page, rewritten with God's grace on our hearts through Jesus. We find ourselves delighting to please God, agreeing with his will, growing in faith and love as a result of all his presence. So what do all this mean for us? Well, as Job found out in the war against Satan, we are not alone. We have a heavenly redeemer and saviour in Jesus Christ who will defeat this prosecutor. Through Jesus, we are made worthy to stand in God's presence. We are welcomed. We know we can approach God with confidence that he wants our praise and our prayers. God's grace is wonderful. He's given us a new way through his Son and his Spirit, encouraging us to keep steadfast in our faith. The Christian life is a marathon, not a hundred metre dash. God is faithful for the long haul and he wants us to stick with him. And helping us to, we too encourage others. Our faith is about sharing, about stirring ourselves up into acts of love and mercy. Most of us at some time are tempted to quit, to ask the question, what's the use? As our problems mount, the doors seem to close, we need to remind ourselves that we have a super saviour and he loves us. And when we become lost, he becomes like a father looking for us. When we are tired and heavy laden, he refreshes us. When we are bruised and suffering, he heals, makes us whole again. No matter what problems we face, what setbacks we experience, we know our Redeemer lives. Jesus is at God's right hand working for us. We must be patient, trust him. In the end, Job was blessed with a new start, more than he had before, and so will we. For the Christian disciple, there's only one way to go forward, to look to Jesus, be guided by him through the power of the Holy Spirit. In a few moments, we will be singing a hymn written by Charlotte Elliott called Just As I Am. Many people feel there's no way that God cannot possibly accept them as they are. They think they must somehow prove themselves first, live lives that are whiter than white, cleaner than clean. But they couldn't be further from the truth. The message from God is that through Jesus Christ, he will accept us as we are, with all our faults, failings, guilty secrets fragile faith, uncertain commitment. God's love will not be dependent on anything we do, but will be given freely out of sheer grace. And if we wait till we think we're perfect, we'll wait forever. We can come to Jesus now, find him ready to welcome us with open arms. And there can be nothing more reassuring than that. Amen.